Good morning. It is always wonderful to be with you on Sunday morning. So welcome to Worship with Unity and Taylor United Methodist Churches. The children's message is posted separately in this group so that I can include music just for them. So if you have a child or a grandchild with you, please let them sing and listen to a message that was planned just for them. I hope you've been able to stay dry this past week and that your electricity was not off for too terribly long and that your property uh, didn't suffer any damage. But even in, in, in adversity, we have much for which we must be thankful. So let us go to the Lord this morning. Dear Lord, we come to you today thanking you for the many blessings that you have placed in our lives. We lift up before you situations and people who are in need of your mercies and your healing power your healing grace. We pause now, Lord, to lift up those that you have placed on our hearts this morning. And Lord, we also have much for which we have, we must be thankful. In the midst of difficulties and troubles, there are also things to celebrate. So we take a moment now to lift up to you our private joys. Lord, bless all of those that we have named before you in our hearts. Touch each life with the blessings and the peace and your mercy. Give us strength and empower us for the ministries of reconciliation, for it is in your name that we pray. Amen.
This morning's scripture is Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Fill each of us with your Holy Spirit, and may only your words be lifted up and heard this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Last week we talked about Moses a little bit and talked mostly about the two ladies that made it possible for him to to uh, live after he was born. We're going to talk about Moses again today, but we're jumping forward uh, quite a few years. You know, when Moses grew up and he was still a member of the of the house of Pharaoh, he killed an Egyptian overseer and became a fugitive. So after that, now it's 40 or so years later. As I said, he's fallen from being an Egyptian uh, royal son to being a shepherd. He's married a woman named Zipporah, um, the daughter of Jethro, a Midianite priest. And he's out in the wilderness tending his father-in-law's sheep. So the night before Moses probably told his sheep good night and laid down to rest. And when he woke up it was just another regular ordinary day with the sheep. Maybe he washed his face, had his breakfast, counted his sheep to make sure they were all still there and he was off to the next grassy knoll. We do the same thing. We wake up, shower, maybe eat breakfast or get the kids off to school or watch, watch our grandchildren until they get on the bus and then we go to work or whatever it is, whatever your routine is, you just expect another day. That's what Moses expected that morning or that, that, that day. He had never heard a spoken word from God. He wasn't particularly religious. He was just like us. No, there weren't any shooting stars. There wasn't a big star in the sky for him to follow. 
There was no signs above, no neon signs that said, God's going to talk to you today, Moses. It was just another ordinary day to make it through. You know, we can easily miss that God loves to step just directly into ordinary days, and He loves to do amazing things. He shows up in an otherwise normal, routine day and speaks to ordinary people. I like to say, he's, God shows up and shows out. But the Bible tells us that Jesus' return is going to be this way. Matthew 24, 37 through 39 says, As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. So this is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. People will be going about their daily business oblivious to the coming of Jesus. And that's the way God works. You joined in today expecting to sing and hear a sermon. Perhaps God's uh, plan is to change your life forever. You see, God works by simply stepping into the ordinary, normal routine that we call life and saying what He wants to say. He says, here's what I want to say to you today. Here's what I want you to be. Here's what I want you to do. You see, isn't it amazing how God can use our curiosity? Moses wasn't really curio curious about religion. No, this was just another day of carrying for Jethro's sheep. In fact, he, he looked up and he saw this glow, this, this burning. And that's, he was, his curiosity led him toward the bush. He wasn't looking for God. What does God use to break through your ordinary day? What does God use to break through the dry desert? By dry desert. Just an ordinary thing in a supernatural way. I don't know how you picture this, this bush, but the word in the Hebrew simply means a thorny scrub. I kind of picture something like a huge tumbleweed. I mean, a really big tumbleweed probably, but just an old, dry, prickly bush. It wasn't the bush that was special. Moses had probably seen thousands of these, maybe even some seen some spontaneously burst into flame from the heat. But then in verse 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that the bush, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. I don't know about you, but if I were face to face with a bush that burned but didn't burn up, I might be, well, no, not might be, I'd be spooked. It seems to me like Moses had no idea God was in the bush. He was simply curious about what was going on. Again, it was not that the bush was that special, but it was what was happening to it. You know, God does that in our lives. He uses ordinary things in extraordinary ways to get our attention. What some call coincidence is actually God's divine providence. I've heard them called God winks. Have you had any God winks in your life? I mean, something that happens that you know that it, you know, well, I don't know about you, but I quit believing in coincidences a long time ago. So what should we do when these unusual events happen? Call Ghost Adventures or Ripley's Believe It or Not? No. I think we should ask ourselves, what is God trying to tell me 
or what is God trying to teach me in this particular moment? This text is telling us that in every ordinary day, through every extraordinary moment, God is seeking you. The old saying is, curiosity killed the cat. But in this is instance, curiosity called the prophet. That's the, that's the title of the sermon today. Curiosity called the prophet. You see, I can see Moses scratching his head and thinking, I'm going to go over there and see what this strange sight is. Why doesn't this bush burn up? Doesn't that make you feel good? I mean, he didn't have any great theological revelation or life-changing meaning in it, but in his moment of curiosity, this moment is leading to a moment of clarity. Exodus 3, 4 says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out, from, out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, do you realize how hard it is for God to get people to stop and look? Tragedies and disasters, car accidents, pandemics, hurricanes, earthquakes, plane crashes, tsunamis, terrorist attacks, health problems, the loss of a, lo a loved one, the loss of a job, it can just go on forever. How do we respond? We usually just shrug these things off and chalk, chalk it up to coincidence or luck. Man, boy, phew, was I lucky I got out of that one. Not so. God brought you out by his strong right arm. It was your burning bush and maybe you missed it. That lost job was not the bad, not bad luck. It was the burning bush of God. Maybe God turning you around for something else. The reason so many Christians never hear from God is because they never take the time out of their busy schedules to turn and look and stop and say and say and look and to see what God is setting a blaze for them. God is clearly saying, what on earth will it take? What will it take to finally convince them to stop and consider what just happened? When God spoke, he said Moses' name twice. He said, Moses, Moses. You know, he did the same thing to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 22, he said, Abraham, Abraham. And he did the same thing to Samuel in 1 Samuel 3.10. Samuel, Samuel. Moses, Moses. It's a Jewish way of showing endearment. God was showing Moses that he both cared for and loved him. He was revealing himself. He reveals himself to us in the same way. He says, Carol, Carol, stop and look. Look what I'm doing for you. Look what I'm doing through you. He says each of our names multiple times. <laughs> so Moses had a moment of clarity, but he's also walking into a moment of destiny. So after 40 years in the wilderness, how did Moses respond? In our translation, it says, I'm here, or it's me, whenever he, God calls Moses his name. But in Hebrew, he just answered with one word. Oh, 40 years earlier, he might have pulled out his resume and said, about time you find me, God, found me, God, I am your man. But now, though, Moses is humble, and he's ready to be filled with the fire of God. 
You know, God isn't impressed with anything about any of us. He examines our humility, our, sensitiv our sensitivity, and our availability. He doesn't want to see our resume. He already knows our resume. But then God says, don't come any closer, Moses. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. In ancient Eastern custom, this shows respect for the owner of the house. Um, what on earth is God trying to say to Moses? Well, he said, you're on holy ground. Holy ground is, is it, when something is holy, it is set apart. So this holy ground is separated ground. While Moses is meeting God, he wants... God wants him wants Moses to separate himself from the his past failures from future endeavors and present responsibilities he just wants God's undivided attention what would it do if before we came in to sing these couple of songs and pray and to hear the, God, the word of God expounded. What if we sat and we removed our shoes? Granted, some of you may still be in the bed listening to this so you don't have your shoes on. But take your shoes off this morning. God wants your undivided attention. It wasn't the bush. It was the moment. That moment with God that was set apart. You see, that was Moses' divine appointment with God. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face and he wouldn't look at God. He was afraid. And in this moment, as, uh, as Moses humbled himself before God, God began to reveal Moses' destiny, that of freeing God's people from tyranny. God fills Moses in on what's going on in Egypt and as Moses' head is still bowed, God says, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And if you read down, on down just a little further, he says, and I will be with you. So God knows exactly where you are and exactly what you are going through. He sees, he cares, he's aware, and he is moved by your concerns. You see, Satan would have you think that God doesn't care. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still lives, cares, and delivers, and he loves each one of us very much. Bow your head Listen for God's plan for you. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now for our closing hymn, let's sing, Here I Am, Lord.
And now let us receive this benediction. Jesus has called you and placed his trust in you. Go into this world bearing the words of hope and healing. Reach out to others in compassion. For it is Jesus' name that you are sent out to serve. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.